Kia ora koutou katoa, nai mai haere mai, koutou tata wanganai. I'd like to, my name is Rachel Taylor and on the behalf of the Department of Medicine, I'd like to welcome you to our seminar today. Um, Barbara, Professor Barbara Galland, a colleague and friend of mine, is going to introduce our speaker, Alistair Neal, for today. Um, and so welcome to you both. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Rachel. So just a little bit about World Sleep Day. First of all, it is hosted by the World Sleep Society and it's been running since about 2008. The whole idea is it's actually a global call to action about the importance of healthy sleep. So the theme this year is quality sleep, sound mind, happy world, quite pertinent in the current era. So there are three elements of good quality sleep and you can read them along the bottom, duration, continuity, continuity and depth of sleep. So have a think about your sleep last night in relation to these elements. So just before I introduce our speaker, just to mention that there will be a Q&A session at the end and the full session, including the Q&A, will be recorded. So introducing our speaker, um, it's my pleasure to welcome our sleep colleague and World Sleep Day guest speaker, Professor Alistair Neal from the Wellington School of Medicine. So Alistair is director of the Well Sleep Sleep Investigation Center and Research Group. He's also a professor of medicine and consultant and sleep respiratory physician at Wellington Hospital. He's also co-chair of the New Zealand Sleep Health Foundation and previous chair of the uh, Sleep in Aotearoa and research chair of the Australasian Sleep Association. So Alistair's presentation is now going to be shared with you. And also just a final thank you to the Department of Medicine and to the Edgar Diabetes and Obesity Research Centre for hosting this event. So thank you. Um, thank you, Barbara, uh, and also, of course, to the organising committee for the invitation to speak today on World Sleep Day 2022 on the importance of sleep for health. I'll just pop up my presentation, if you just bear with me. The theme, Sound Mind and Happy World, could not be more apt uh, on a backdrop of a global pandemic and a senseless war that's currently raging in Europe. Our collective thoughts and minds are focused absolutely on both health and security at the moment. We spend nearly a third of our lives asleep. Sleep is one of the pillars of good health, just as important as exercise and diet. Sleep, in my view, is a human right. The Indian Supreme Court determined that sleep was essential for uh, human health and that there must be sufficient hours in any day dedicated towards uh, being able to have adequate sleep. To sleep, we must, be, uh, we must have a safe environment that is not bloodied by war. To sleep, we must have safe housing and a decent roof over our heads. To sleep, we need international leaders, including Vladimir Putin, who uh, need to stop going to war. Not all agree on the importance of sleep. According to Netflix CEO, Reed Hastings, the human need for sleep is his biggest competitor. Today, I would like to uh, take you through um, some thoughts uh, on what is, what is a, essentially a healthy sleep, what, what happens when we go to sleep, how sleep can be uh, both adaptable and can uh, respond to needs in more unusual circumstances, how uh, sleep is affected by age and give you some information on how to improve your sleep. I'd like also to talk about some of the common sleep disorders, particularly in light of um, what's been occurring as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
sleep um, is fundamentally restorative at both an individual and cellular level. Uh, the current uh, best theories on, on what happens when we sleep are that we collect a whole lot of data um, across the day in our neurons and we store this data by forming synaptic connect connections with dendrites between neurons. And uh, this information then has to be pruned and assessed and graded for its importance overnight. So that by morning, uh, as a result of that pruning process, you can store information that's important as part of your longer term human experience. Sleep is also energy saving, but uh, this is at the risk of being, uh, pr being predated upon. Uh, so what you see is that animals that are uh, lower down the food chain often tend to sleep for shorter periods of time. Sleep is essential for learning, creativity and normal growth. And most adults seem to need about seven to nine hours. It's governed by well-known homeostatic and circadian processes. It's active and it's highly regulated, composed of both REM and non-REM sleep. This slide uh, shows a hypnogram of adult sleep. And you can see here that there are cycles of non-REM below the line and REM sleep above the line that are occurring intermittently throughout the night. And as, as the night progresses, there is increasingly more REM sleep. Now you'll be familiar with this term, rapid eye movement sleep. It was discovered many years ago, but essentially during the stage of sleep, the eyes are seen to twitch regularly. The tone is very low. Um, and it's thought to be when we have our dreaming. Um, one of the reasons that's recognized for the, or one of the reasons that we have that low tone is that otherwise we tend to act out our, our dream phenomena. Uh, deep sleep, on the other hand, is confined uh, more to the first third of the night. Uh, this is when we're much harder to be aroused. Um, this is also when we see things like sleepwalking and night terrors. This slide shows the two important processes that govern why we feel sleepy. In the top panel is the homeostatic process, which essentially means that the longer you're awake, the greater the need is for sleep. So you can see that this progressively increases across the day and is relieved uh, when you get a decent night's sleep and then starts again the next day. The second process is a circadian-based process. And this essentially means that during a certain part of a 24-hour day, we are more likely, we have a greater propensity to fall asleep. And you can see in this example that this lines up with um, when uh, you might typically expect sleep to occur at night. Um, in addition, especially in older people, we see a mid-afternoon uh, dip in alertness, um, which is, coincides with when cultures often will have a siesta or a bit of a aziz in the armchair. Uh, you can see that the circadian process is um, governed by the secretion of, of melatonin, shown here, which coincides with when our circadian rhythms are strongest. And this is secreted uh, by a gland called the pineal gland, which is regarded as the brain's master clock. Um, as we get older, the amount of melatonin reduces. Melatonin is strongly associated with sleep propensity. So you would imagine that in an older individual, that sleep propensity might be reduced. Um, light uh, has a strong effect on melatonin secretion and can also be used to help shift the timing of when we go to sleep. So that, uh, for example, if you travel to another country and your eyes are exposed to a different uh, time zone and light changes, then your circadian rhythms will gradually shift to adjust to that new time zone. As we um, 
age, our sleep changes considerably. You can see an, an infant sleep pattern shown up here, which has got many more cycles than uh, the other examples, a bit more deep sleep and plenty of REM. Um, in a young adult, we see a more consolidated process, which I talked about before, where quite a lot of the deep sleep is confined to the first third of the night. Uh, but by around age 30, uh, people are starting to wake three to four times spontaneously by themselves without necessarily there being a reason for that. It's just part of what happens as you get older. And it's important not to interpret these as you know, a problem or, or a scent or, or you know, that you should have been sleeping through the night. Otherwise, that can tend to lead to anxiety and promote insomnia. If you look at the older individual, they still have a, a strong need for their sleep, but there's quite obvious periods where they're awake for an hour or two during the night, but they can still be restored by this type of sleep pattern. Um, shown here is how um, sleep can be regarded as something that, that is adapted across the animal kingdom to different needs. So here in this panel, an, an elephant you can see is sleeping for perhaps three or four hours over a 24 hour period. And when it's in non-REM sleep, it will stand while it's sleeping. But as soon as it goes into REM when the muscle tone is lower, uh, uh, the elephant will lie down. Dolphins are um, really amazing. They, they have what's called unihemispheric uh, sleep, where one side of the brain is asleep while the other side is active. And they can be seen in the wild to be gradually swimming in a circle, and then they'll change direction when they change over to the other hemisphere. And this allows them to, to sleep and, and breathe and maintain uh, a little bit of vigilance at the same time whilst out in the ocean. Um, the un New Zealand fur seal is able to do the same thing uh, whilst it's at sea, so unihemispheric sleep, but very cleverly when it returns to land, it will return to bihemispheric sleep. Um, birds are another example of incredible adaptation. Birds are able to um, sleep in a normal 24-hour cycle, perhaps relatively short periods. But when they migrate, they, they completely switch off the sleeping process while they're in flight and then return to a more normal sleep pattern when they reach their destination. Uh, interestingly, they're also able to sleep with one eye open, uh, which is thought to be an adaptation to the vigilance needed to avoid a prowling cat or other predator. Uh, the traditional view of sleep is that um, it's a whole of a brain process that's uh, top down. So as these as these drives to sleep uh, um, increase, the homeostatic and circadian drive, there's a there's a set of um, inhibiting sleep center systems that switch the whole brain off and impose sleep on a top down kind of way. Um, this is not the only theory of sleep, and there's been a really interesting theory that's been developing probably over the last 10 years or so, but it's just as important where uh, there is evidence that sleep can actually be locally seen uh, within different parts of the, of the brain, independent of each other. So this research was done in um, epilepsy sufferers who were undergoing um, monitoring for um, epilepsy surgery. And what they showed uh, was that parts of the brain could be individually starting to go to sleep before other areas. Um, and that these, are, these areas would then sort of spread and form networks that would eventually uh, result in sleep. Um, why this is important is that the the traditional uh, way of thinking of sleep as being the whole brain doesn't explain some of the really interesting phenomena that can happen when you're asleep. And one of the main ones is sleepwalking, whereby we know that um, in a sleepwalker, there are parts of the brain that are clearly very active, uh, whereas other parts are deeply asleep. So the, the person's in slow wave sleep typically, but that able to walk about, they might be talking, they might be um, engaged in motor activity, uh, and this can really only occur with the local sleep hypothesis being held as being true. 
The other area in which it's probably very important is uh, in the misperception of sleep that can occur in some patients with insomnia. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, human sleep also uh, has the ability to adapt, and I've shown you an example there of the round-the-world yacht sailors who adapt to the watch system by sleeping every two to three hours when they're off duty and then being awake, of course, when they're on deck. And so they were able to spread their sleep across uh, the, the watch shift system. Um, humans uh, tend to be a bit variable in their ability to cope with um, disruption to sleep. This is especially uh, seen in shift workers, where the younger you are, the more easy it is for you to adapt to a shift, a rotating shift. And also, if you're a, a bit, bit of a night owl type of uh, sleep phenotype, it's a bit easier to cope with shift work. Um, whereas some older people just find they can't manage. Um, it's also harder when these uh, sleep um, um, disruptions are cumulative, happening over many nights. Uh, this uh, is a uh, slide uh, showing uh, data from uh, Ricky Harris's uh, research um, looking into how Kiwis sleep. So this was a 10,000 uh, sample uh, sent out um, and, and collected. They were asked a number of questions, including information about their total sleep time. And what you'll see here is that uh, the average amount, the median amount of sleep is around seven hours, but quite a few people were sleeping less than six and quite a few were sleeping greater than 10 hours, not the majority, but a, a proportion. And her main finding, however, was that around 40% of people felt that they never or really were getting enough sleep or never or really felt they were waking refreshed. So quite a lot of sleep complaints within the Kiwi um, community. Uh, the uh, notion of um, only needing five hours sleep as core sleep has pretty much been thrown out now uh, by the research that's been uh, developed. So um, what, we, what we now believe from most of the scientific studies is that you can measure decreases in performance when people uh, consistently sleep for less than seven hours per night, it gets progressively worse as the amount of sleep is reduced. Um, and this is particularly important for shift workers and night workers who end up with, with relatively greater disruption to their sleep, um, increased accident rates and a whole lot of other health problems that can go along with that. Um, it's also known that um, even though when, when you're awake at night, uh, because of restricted sleep, you are going to burn more calories, this is completely um, compensated for and overcompensated for by an increase in appetite and, and high calorie consumption uh, eating type of behavior. So when, when most people have a night where they sleep poorly, one of the first things you do is you go for high calorie food. And so that overall the energy balance is in favor of weight gain uh, rather than uh, weight loss. So it's, it's thought to be an obesity promoting state. Uh, what about sleep during lockdown? Uh, so this was looked at, uh, looked at by a colleague, uh, Rosie Gibson from the Sleep Weight Research Center at Massey, who studied 700 uh, participants in a survey. I was actually one of the participants. And uh, what she found was that uh, over half of the people who responded defined themselves as poor sleepers. Um, and of those, 45% of them rated that their sleep got worse during the lockdown. So a definite worsening in their sleep patterns. Interestingly, um, around 22% of her sample reported that sleep actually improved. And I was in that, in, I was actually in that camp. So that for me and for this group, the um, lockdown provided an opportunity to actually sleep longer because we were home based uh, for unless we were on duty, um, but the, the health system, at least at that stage, had not been overwhelmed with a whole lot of COVID cases. Um, so there's this, um, you know, there's this difference. Some people sleep better, other people are experiencing anxiety and, and worsening insomnia. 
so uh, what was it like for healthcare workers? Um, well, I think the important thing to remember uh, for frontline healthcare workers is that they have the added stresses on their sleep normally of long duty hours, uh, shift work, and emergency callback where they might be asked to come back and do another shift for a colleague who can't be available. Uh, the donning of personal protective equipment um, is pretty time consuming and stressful in its own right. So you're putting on this gear, aiming to try uh, wherever possible not to uh, have any have any leaks or, or issues with putting it on. And the whole process just takes a whole lot of extra time. Healthcare workers, like all of us, have been subject to constant media messaging about the pandemic and the risks of it and vaccination. Um, which has also been quite stressful. And they have their own family and health worries to consider as well with about one in 10 of the COVID-19 cases being in healthcare workers. So as a group, they're at risk from this virus. Um, and more recently, as, the, as the, the Omicron pandemic has kicked in, we're seeing quite high numbers, at least 15% of frontline workers who are isolating because they either have COVID or are a close contact. Um, sleep uh, has an important uh, effect in terms of uh, vaccination. So it's been known uh, from previous vaccination research that if you sleep poorly uh, before vaccination, and, and this uh, study shown here in 1997, uh, the flu vaccination was given after four nights of sleeping, only four hours of sleep per night. And they found that the antibody responses were less than half of the group that had been sleeping well. So absolute blunting of the normal antibody response that we'd usually expect to see for vaccination. Um, and the same, um, same finding was found for hepatitis vaccination. Uh, and in the studies that I've been reading, uh, this was seen with uh, poor sleep beforehand and also poor sleep after the vaccination. So, so sleep's important both before and after these types of vaccination. And a, a differential sleep response could be important in explaining why there's an individual variability in the COVID-19 uh, vaccine response. Uh, from the same group of researchers, it's, they have indicated that um, the best time to be vaccinated is in the morning. So timing of vaccination is important uh, to, get, to get the optimum immune response. Um, one of the areas that has been a focus within the sleep community is concern about the development of narcolepsy after the 2009 uh, Padamerix uh, influenza vaccination in Europe. So uh, what was seen was a, a big increase in the number of cases of narcolepsy uh, after this special formulation of a flu vaccination. Uh, but when this was realised, they reformulated it and most other countries, including New Zealand, Australia and Canada, uh, did not actually see this occur. But so there was so there has been concern about some uh, vaccinations and the risk of a, a sleep disorder called narcolepsy. Um, but fortunately, there's no evidence that um, this is currently the case with our, our COVID-19 vaccines, either the Pfizer or uh, AstraZeneca, which is good, of course. So uh, what can you do to get yourself a good night's sleep? Um, uh, one of the things that's important is to understand uh, what are good sleep habits, and I can share those uh, for you, and I'll go through some of them in the next few slides. We need to understand that any kind of stress in our lives will tend to impact our sleep. That's a natural response to stress. Um, we need to understand the effects of any medication that we're on. So for example, asthma meds or blood pressure tablets can sometimes affect sleep. We need to understand our own bodies, our own sleep needs, our own, uh, the, own, our, the own benefits of uh, exercise. Um, if we're working from home, uh, it's really important to have a clear separation between work, uh, leisure and our sleep places. 
uh, to give that sort of separation mentally that you're now off work and into either leisure or sleep. Um, and also very important to have a device curfew uh, because of the known alerting effects of both television and blue light screens on mobile phones. Sleep science provides a, a, us with a strong rationale as to uh, what are the things that we need to do to get a good night's kip. Uh, so you can see um, from this homeostatic drive that we talked about before, uh, that it's important if we're going to have a strong drive to sleep, to not to go not to go to sleep too early, um, and also um, to uh, not nap during the day because a nap will tend to reduce that homeostatic drive. Um, and going to bed too early will be before we've reached the peak here. Um, so that one of the pieces of advice that I sometimes give when I'm talking to someone with insomnia is that they actually need to decrease the amount of time they spend in bed awake before they actually switch the lights off and try to get some sleep. Uh, we know from the circadian rhythm science that it's helpful to get up at the same time every day um, and to get good levels of morning light exposure as this sets the sleep circadian rhythm for the next night. Um, and if you do happen to be wide awake, it's important not to remain in bed wide awake, to, to have a strategy such as either, either moving to another uh, zone and and relaxing or, or reading something that's very boring or listening to meditation music or, or, or something that just distracts your mind from the fact that you're ruminating over trying to get back to sleep. Um, now to talk about a couple of common uh, sleep disorders. Um, insomnia is very common, as I've shown here, but it affects probably around 10% of the New Zealand population. Insomnia symptoms are even more common at around quarter of the adult population. It's defined as the inability to initiate and maintain sleep with an associated daytime symptom. Um, it can be acute or it can be chronic. Um, and it tends to be worse when there's when there are high levels of community stress. One of the interesting things about insomnia, and we've we've studied this in a community setting, is that often people uh, will overestimate the amount of uh, hours that they're awake and underestimate the amount of sleep that they get. Um, and in some insomnia sufferers, we'll see a pattern where they'll feel like they're virtually getting no sleep at all, but when we do a sleep study on them, we'll show that they're getting a normal amount of sleep. Um, and th this is called paradoxical insomnia. And uh, for a long time, people have not really understood it. They've thought that it could be, you know, just inaccurate reporting. Uh, but in actual fact, the local sleep hypothesis uh, is very relevant here. And the current thinking on this is that uh, this doesn't reflect the person not telling the truth. It reflects the fact that in insomnia, um, it's possible to perceive the lighter stages of sleep as actually being awake. So, so parts of the brain are aroused and, and recording what's happening around you. Other parts are actually asleep. Um, and um, this is particularly the case for insomniacs who have this high level of cortical arousal or or a greater tendency to anxiety. Um, and uh, this, uh, these observations and uh, some really excellent thinking uh, by researchers around this have, has led to a classification of insomnia, whereby we try to work out whether a person has insomnia with the perception of abnormal sleep, but actually objectively normal amounts of sleep, and insomnia uh, sufferers who have a very short duration of sleep. This type of um, insomnia is associated with um, sympathetic activation, higher cortisol, more hypertension, more diabetes, and is a more serious type of insomnia. 
whereas the insomnia with normal sleep duration is a milder form of insomnia and can be managed often uh, with psychological measures and reassurance and, and, and training and, and an explanation as to what's happening going on. Um, both types of insomnia are, will benefit from something called cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's particularly helpful for this normal duration insomnia, um, whereas sometimes we might need to, to use medication for the short duration insomnia. Um, uh, moving on now to breathing. Uh, during awake breathing, uh, we see that this is a well-coordinated um, activation of respiratory muscles starting at the nose and coordinated through the diaphragm and ribs. We see the lungs inflate, oxygen uptake, CO2 removal, and we see quite tight regulation of breathing um, by uh, sensors in the brain and the carotid body looking at changes in CO2 and oxygen levels. Um, when we go to sleep, um, things are quite different. Um, the body position is usually lying flat or supine. Breathing is mainly via nasal root. Uh, it is under, under the control of the autonomic nervous system, which has been shown to be less sensitive to CO2 and oxygen levels. Uh, we commonly see the muscle tone in the upper airway here decrease so that the airway itself becomes more floppy. And this is particularly the case in REM sleep uh, when the muscle tone uh, drops away. We'll also see large risk and switch off the, the drive to breathe. And we can sometimes see an arousal cause a pattern of a deep breath and then an overshoot, undershoot. And this scene uh, sets the scene for one of the common um, disorders of sleep called obstructive sleep apnea, where in these individuals, uh, with sleep onset, we see the tone drop and the, and the airway narrowing to the point that an obstruction occurs where there's then decreased ventilation, hypoxia, and an increase in blood pressure. In an obstructive sleep apnea sufferer, they get repetitive arousals, repetitive desaturations, which makes them feel tired and unrefreshed uh, the next day. Obstructive sleep apnea is the commonest sleep breathing disorder. It's characterized by, by heavy snoring, uh, witnessed apneas, and waking feeling quite unrefreshed. It affects around four to eight percent of the population. Uh, and it's common in men compared to premenopausal women, and it's especially common in middle age and also in Pacific and uh, Maori New Zealanders. Uh, Population-based studies show that sleep disorder breathing is also very common, up to a quarter of the middle aged population can have some um, irregularity to their breathing during sleep, but not usually symptoms associated with it. Uh, we've undertaken uh, research shown here um, indicating that Māori men and women have uh, more uh, severe obstructive sleep apnea and a higher prevalence of the condition. Um, some of the treatments for sleep apnea are shown here and they include weight loss, um, reduction in alcohol or sedatives if people are taking them, sleeping on your side as opposed to on your back, um, stopping medications that might be relaxing the throat muscles, and an important treatment called nasal CPAP, which delivers positive airway pressure to help keep the airway open during sleep. Um, um, it's a important and interesting to consider how stress can promote sleep disorders. Um, we've already talked a little bit about insomnia and it's easy to see and appreciate how stress and insomnia could be quite closely linked together, especially if the stress is ongoing. Um, it's a little bit harder and, and less obvious to understand how stress can affect your breathing. And so I'll take you through that. Um, so uh, one of the things that's recognised when we are um, having a stress response to something is that it activates our fight or flight 
sympathetic type nervous system and this usually leads to mouth opening and an increase in breathing so we are if you like preparing the body to be oxygenated by increasing our ventilation now in some people um, who perhaps especially if they're not if they're perceiving this threat and it's not actually there it's a it's a, a persistent worry if you like um, this over breathing can make you feel unwell because it lowers co2 which has a has a whole lot of, of physical effects on the body tingling faintness uh, a sense of fatigue dizziness gastric symptoms that type of thing so they they feel unwell this increases the anxiety which leads to more over breathing and an increase in symptoms so hyperventilation is a very, very important manifestation of stress for some people now, why that's important is that this overbreathing lowers CO2 levels uh, at sleep onset, and this can predispose to periods of sleep apnea as the person goes in and out of different stages of sleep. Also, with the mouth opening that occurs, this makes obstruction of the upper airway more likely. Uh, so this means that both central apneas and obstructive sleep apneas occur more commonly with this type of scenario. Um, and people end up getting symptoms from hyperventilation syndrome as well. Um, uh, so uh, what I've explained to you uh, is that these two common conditions, OSA and insomnia, are occurring out in our community. So it wouldn't come as any surprise that they, because they are so common, that they can also occur together. Um, and some of the very interesting research that's been looking at people have both conditions show that by treating the sleep apnea, it can help improve the insomnia. And interestingly, the the other is true as well, which is that if you treat insomnia in someone who has obstructive sleep apnea uh, with a cognitive behavioral therapy approach, it actually improves the severity of OSA as well. So these two conditions are very important and can co-relate together. Um, moving on now to occupational health. Um, Normally, uh, in a sleep service like ours, uh, we would be regularly reviewing people from safety critical areas such as aviation industry, railways, trucking, and, and the motor vehicle side of things. Um, what's been the effect of the pandemic on this? Well, we've virtually seen no pilots uh, because no one has been flying for the last two years. Um, there has been a reduction in the number of referrals we've had for people who are truck who are train drivers i'm not totally sure why but i suspect that the just there's been a lot a lot less people uh, going undergoing all forms of transport um truck driving car driving still uh, has been important why do we screen for these these conditions well sleep disorders and, and problems with sleepiness in this population can lead to accidents and errors and sometimes quite with quite serious consequences um, so this, in this picture here, you can see that there's a train driver who's fallen asleep. One of the reasons uh, for this is that in many companies, uh, there are no longer two drivers in the cab, um, and alertness has been uh, maintained uh, with um, alertness monitoring systems like the dead man switch, where you have to respond to a button uh, every five minutes or so. Um, but Train driving itself is, is a very boring and, and tedious kind of activity. And so when a, a driver falls asleep, it's under quite soporific conditions, but it can potentially have quite disastrous effects with each derailment uh, causing about a, a million dollars worth of damage when we've looked at it previously. Um, car driving, um, this... Um, slide uh, is just um, making emphasis to the fact there's been a very good research study that guides the risk factors for fatigue related crashes in um, in most clinics in New Zealand and Jenny Connors um, identified in her studies that these were the key risk factors for um, 
sleep related crashes. Uh, she worked out that around 20% uh, of all crashes were fatigue related, really high rate, and that these were the key risk factors driving when you normally feel asleep, be asleep, um, driving after less than five hours of prior sleep, and driving when you were feeling sleepy. Um, Driver fatigue has continued over each time uh, we've looked at it to be of enormous importance as a cause of crashes. You can see the 2016 data there and also the 2020 where 25 deaths and 113 serious injuries were thought to be fatigue uh, related. Um, what's important um, throughout all of these measures is that the rural driving crash statistics remain very high and the deadliest. So that something like 73% of deaths on rural road were on rural roads rather than on the motorways of much lower proportion than on urban roads. So there's something about driving in a rural setting um, where there's quite a high ongoing risk of uh, fatigue related accidents and injuries. So what's been the impact of COVID-19 um, on these fatalities? Well, I'm sure you'll, you'll all, all remember with amazement in Easter last year, uh, sorry, 2020, that, that during the lockdown, no lives were lost. So we had an Easter road, road toll of zero. It was just incredible. Um, and the statistics have kind of gone on to, to show that with, this is throughout the year in 2020. There's a massive reduction um, in uh, road deaths and also injuries as a result of there being a marked reduction in the amount of traffic volume across this period. So I guess it's it's one bright light that has has been there um, as a result of the restrictions because of course, but of course, unfortunately, it hasn't been sustained. Um, we also know that um, some sleep disorders increase crash risk. We know that obstructive sleep apnea can sometimes make people feel sleepy enough to have an accident. Um, but this tends to be clustered in people who have quite severe symptomatic sleep apnea and ha are having multiple accidents. We absolutely do see some individuals through the clinic who have sleep apnea that's severe in terms of the number of events per hour, but for them, they don't seem to be as sleepy on the road. We don't know exactly why this is, but it is definitely the case. Um, there's been some technology that's been introduced into, especially the um, the truck driving uh, sector to help ma monitor and maintain alertness. Uh, this is the OptAlert system that's used in the um, in the mines in Australia and also in some driving companies in New Zealand. And there's been increasing uh, work on technology in cars, which are now monitoring your position on the on the road, giving drivers warnings if they're starting to show signs of fatigue. Um, and I guess the the ultimate would be a drive. So what about sleep services during the pandemic? Um, I can, I'm sure you can imagine that uh, these types of services, uh, like many um, out, primarily outpatient-based services, have been quite seriously impacted. So uh, we've had periods where our clinics have had to close or to go to an online model. Uh, we've had times when our, our sleep laboratory has had to close. Uh, we've been uh, challenged by the different levels and PPE requirements. Uh, we've tried to adapt by using um, online type of systems by moving the sleep studies into a home environment, which our group are already pretty good at doing. We've tried um, doing CPAP trials um, remotely by sending the equipment out with instructions and helping people fit the masks and things like that over the phone. Uh, when we've looked at the effect of that, we've found that the, um, the success is not as good. Uh, people don't do as well when you use remote models for treatment, um, but they do pretty well with some of the remote models for testing. Uh, so we're learning as we go. Um, there's also been um, professional society concern 
regarding the risks of CPAP as an aerosol generating device and spreading COVID to both, both patients and to staff. Um, I'll just uh, remind you what CPAP is like. So this is a positive airway pressure system where um, a machine is delivering air down a mask. Uh, it's got a little vent in it um, and the mouth is kept closed. So you sort of breathing in and out of this positive pressure environment and it will undoubtedly disperse um, air um, in a direction, especially depending on where the filter is. Um, so it's important to think about uh, whether or not this is a risk uh, if you uh, have high levels of COVID in the community. Um, and um, we know uh, that uh, we're now um, in a phase where we've moved from a successful public health response to the fact that we're just um, basically getting on with it and, and living uh, with the virus. We're in the middle of the highest kind of level of the pandemic. Um, a high, very high number of daily cases, although uh, reassuringly a very low um, death rate overall, which is good. Um, we also know um, that if patients come into hospital uh, with COVID-19 and need uh, respiratory support um, for a sort of worsening pneumonitis shown in this slide, that, that we've got a range of different strategies uh, that we can help support a patient, including everything from an intubation where we take over the patient's breathing to different forms of oxygen and positive airway pressure. Um, one of the um, things that has come out of overseas report is that um, CPAP has been shown uh, when it is delivered with oxygen to be superior to some of the other forms of oxygen. Um, so that um, if you are unwell with a pneumonitis and you're needing to have respiratory support, most of the hospitals are now going to offer you CPAP delivered at 10 centimetres of water with oxygen blended to try and maintain your oxygen levels. The other option, um, which is a fish and pike device, is called nasal high flow. It's also well tolerated. It's pretty good um, treatment as well, and it's been very successfully used in pneumonia in the past. Um, one of the ways of helping reduce suspicion from high flow um, is to put a little surgical mask over it so you can see the dispersion plume occurring here, but this can be quite effectively reduced uh, by covering uh, the system uh, with a surgical mask. And uh, getting to the point of whether these things are aerosol generating, my view uh, is that they're not. Um, and I think that there's good support uh, for the fact that um, that um, that CPAP and high flow and indeed these bi-level devices don't produce, produce any more aerosols than standard old oxygen like four litres per minute. Um, and also that things like coughing and speaking and singing are much more aerosol generating. So, sh so we shouldn't be at all concerned about the risks of, of actually producing aerosols uh, with with CPAP in my view, but we should acknowledge that it is able to disperse um, COVID-19 quite effectively. So have good ventilation around a patient, um, have them in a single uh, room, negative pressure with a high exchange and HIPAA filtration. So I think that the, the, the concern about, um, about CPAP in terms of aerosol generating has not really been supported by the literature, which is good. Um, and it means that we don't need to be as worried um, about using this in a sleep clinic situation. Um, so it's important, as I've said here, um, to um, adapt to COVID, but not halt essential services and to um, recognize that CPAP has actually been a very effective um, treatment for COVID-19 in hospital and that we should continue to be able to use this um, um, in sleep clinics and for obstructive sleep apnea if it's clinically required. Um, so to conclude, um, I um, hope that I have illustrated to you um, some inter interesting information about how we sleep and um, 
what the many health benefits are of a good night's sleep. We discuss how um, any stress, including a pandemic or other things that, that, that stress us can actually interact with sleep and that we've seen evidence from uh, research that's been collected in New Zealand of, of worsening in many people's sleep during the pandemic. Um, there have been a number of challenges to providing sleep disorders services, which I've mentioned already. Um, but we should always remember that sleep is a really important pillar of good health and that we need to be able to adapt to those situations by prioritizing our sleep so that we can ensure our peak ongoing performance, that we get a great immune response and that we, and that we end up having a fantastic vaccinated immunity so that we can cope with the COVID and the many other viruses that we're going to end up um, having eventually because overall sleep is good for us and it makes us more resilient. Um, and on that, I shall finish and be very happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks for the opportunity of speaking today. Thank you very much, Alistair. That's an incredible overview, just covering a lot of really good information. And um, even just going back to the animal sleep, I'm always really interested in the different types of sleep of different species. Um, look, we've got time for, for questions. Now, it's going to be, we've got a, a approximately 70 people on here at the moment. It's going to be quite difficult to do that, but I'm going to, um, I've got my gallery view open. So if you're wanting to ask a question, um, you'll have to put your, be best if you put your video on and hold your hand up and I can um, just scroll through. So I think while we're waiting for that, um, I can get the ball rolling. Most people are, not got the videos on. Um, so, Alistair, I was just wondering about uh, COVID-19 in terms of the long COVID. Is there any information in the literature about what effects that might have on sleep or might in, in the future for, for people? Um, I think it's still early days with that. When I've been, I've been watching this area um, as it sort of unfold, and I think that we still don't have a good definition for long COVID. Uh, but I know uh, from some of the cases that I've had an involvement with that that sleep disruption and insomnia can be part of the symptoms that you could have. Um, but also, I think um, over breathing is important as well. So that if in, in anything, as I showed you in that site, anything that causes persistent anxiety can make us breathe more in a, in a sense more than we need to and produce symptoms of over breathing and so things like tingling breathlessness a sense of discomfort a sense of fatigue can be part of long COVID type symptoms so I think we'll need to keep an eye out for that because it's very important to recognize that for, for what it is and also to make sure that it's being correctly kind of diagnosed and, and classified that, that's just a personal view yeah. thank you so I'm just going to go across the screen now so Pedro hello Pedro um hi thank you for the talk it was very good uh very good to know about all of this information. And I was wondering about um, some apps and softwares that I've seen around that claim to track your sleep and then um, you can regulate their alarm clock to be within 30 minutes. So the app claims that it is going to wake you in the optimal part of your sleep. Um, I was wondering if you think that's a good thing how how accurate can those softwares be and yeah if that's a good thing to implement it's a, yeah it's a hard question to uh, this is an area of barbara's uh, research interest but I, I think there's an enormous number of devices uh, you know what i like about devices is, is it fits into that idea of your own personalized health so that that your that it's really helpful for you to know about the things that could affect your health. So I, I like that fact um, on the one hand. On the other hand, the devices themselves are not necessarily that well um, 
researched and adapted yet. And, and also from, from a sleep perspective, they can create anxiety so that, you know, the first thing you do, you jump out of bed, you look at your device in the morning and you see what it thinks about your sleeping process. And, and one of the things that's not very good for sleep overall is if you are overly focused and worried about it. You know, you can, you're better to actually understand about the sleeping processes, the things that are really good for sleep, and then let the sleep look after itself. Because if you watch it too much, and if you focus too much on it, you can actually end up with poorer sleep. So it's, a, it's hard to answer that question. Barbara might like to comment on the devices, but. No, uh, I mean, the same thing, I, I can become a bit fixated with a Fitbit, you know, looking at that all the time. And I think that's probably been researched more than the device that you're talking about. So, you know, sure, there's lots, lots out there, but they haven't researched, been researched that well to know um, how, how good they are. So, okay, um, so Rachel, next. Great, thanks very much, Alistair. I was interested to read on, um, I think it was on Stuff this morning, that in the States they have passed a law or something like that about changing daylight saving, mm -hmm. making daylight saving time permanent time, and yet some sleep experts had come outside out and said that normal time should be the permanent time, not di daylight saving. I was just wondering about your opinion about that and, and sort of why. Yeah, um... So I, I don't have a strong opinion on it because I suspect it's very locally dependent. So that if you're if you're in a community where where the, where lots of people really get value out of the change in the time, um, and I can sort of think of possibly farmers. Um, it doesn't doesn't affect a you know someone working in an urban environment. They pr pretty much aren't affected too much by daylight saving, but there may, there may be effects that are more important for the rural community. So you'd probably want to, to ask about that. And it's it does affect a country like ours, which has quite a big difference between Northland and Southland in terms of when the sun rises and sets. So you know, I, I think it's probably something that deserves quite a lot of discussion um, to, to figure out what, what works best for the community. I don't have a strong sleep perspective on it. I think we're going to hear more about that in the future, but it's also for research. It's a real pain when we're trying to um, study children's <laughs> sleep and we've got to do everything around outside of the school holidays and outside of daylight saving to keep everything stable. Yeah. Okay, uh, so Shaimal. Yep. Uh, thank you, um, Alistair. It was a, such a good presentation and, and um, a public need. My question is about a relationship of exercise and exercise time with sleep sure. because when i do exercise uh, like um, uh, in the evening sometimes it takes me time and uh, I, when i go to sleep i can't sleep yep. it takes time yep no that's that's a very so you um so that i think that what the Research supports with it. So exercise is really good for helping help deepen sleep. And it's also a good stress reliever for many people. So I, you know, exercise can be used as a good strategy for helping with sleep. Uh, most people would recommend that you exercise either in the morning or during the day rather than in the evening because it is more alerting. Uh, and so not everybody has that experience, but I, th I think that, that that's what most people would say. So, so exercise is great for sleep, just the timing, have a think about the timing. It's better not to be too close to your sleep time. Thank you. So, Taiwo? Taiwo, hi. You're on, you need to unmute Taiwo. Yeah, yeah. Right. well, thank you, Alistair. Uh, I'm just, uh, wondering as Todd is looking into how housing conditions affect sleep given that New Zealand are some of the least affordable housing in the developed world mm -hmm. and I reckon that that would have effect on sleep and sleep hours and all that. So I, I absolutely agree with you. I, th I think um, I, you know I think that housing you often hear about housing but not what, what you do in houses but but we're spending a third of our lives asleep. And so for many people, 
in in housing that's either unaffordable or the only way they've been able to afford it is to have multiple people living under the same roof there's lots of sleep disruption that can occur as, as a result of inadequate housing and uh, i agree that it should be a priority to make sure that we've got good housing um, and and, and enough bedrooms within a house for people to sleep comfortably because that's the secondary part of it. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Taiwo. Uh, so, Rachel, you've got another question or you're... Yep, yep. While we're waiting for, for some other questions. Um, Alistair, I wondered how you... Sleep has very much been focused in the sleep medicine sort of capacity, and it's only relatively recently come into the more sort of public health um, arena or a sleep health arena. How do you think we can encourage uh, even more attention to be paid to sort of good sleep health or sleep for public health as opposed to medicine to, to get more groups, organisations, etc. sort of aware mm. that it really is an important part of life. Just sort of any ideas for strategies for that? Yeah, that's hard. That's hard. I think, I think as a community, we need to speak up about it. So to share the sleep science um, to get involved, get community organisations involved to make sure that um, the, the regulators, which have been quite interested in things like traffic accidents and working hours, to make sure that they're continuously building on that so that we've got safe workplaces and safe roads and things like that. You know, I think I think that the first phase of the research that's been going on has been looking at things like crash rates and making sure that serious cra crashes have a fatigue. Um, investigation component to them so that's a requirement now but it's it's very widespread so I think I think there's a lot to do um, but those are those are some thoughts that I would have in terms of what we need to keep doing yeah thanks thank you um, yeah so I think also that just having an event like this actually really raises the awareness and using the um, world sleep day to, to build from that so um, look we're just right up to time so I'm just going to leave Rachel to to close off now and just thank you again Alistair from me. Pleasure. Yeah, on behalf of uh, Medicine and EDOR and Women's and Children's Health and a whole variety of other places, um, Namihi and Alistair, that was a really excellent overview of sleep and health. Um, I thought the sleep and vaccination thing was fascinating. Um, mm. It wasn't something that I'd come across before. So I really do think that was interesting. Um, and yeah, let's, let's keep raising the profile of sleep. And thank you so much for contributing today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming and listening. It's great to see you all there. Thanks. And I meant to say, with more than 90 people, it's clearly yep. a topic of interest. So yep. well done. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.